and we will get started. All right. So first I wanna thank some organizations that helped develop this presentation, the Florida Solar Energy Center, you'll see references to them throughout. Um, some local solar contractors, Brilliant Harvest, Region Solar, um, as well as um, Harriman Solar provided some quotes that I'll, I'll give you information on. And then the Program for Resource Efficient Communities at the University of Florida also helped with a lot of this information. So I've, I've asked this question in the um, chat box, but as you think of other things, don't hesitate to let me know. Um, there were questions about um, tax credits available in which years, so it's important to know um, what kind of incentives are there. All right, so the first thing, and I hope you'll take this away no matter what else you learn, is that we don't want you to waste your money on solar kilowatts installed because it's cheaper per kilowatt saved to actually do efficiency in almost every case. So we want you to look at your home or your business or your barn um, and think about what you could do in terms of efficiency first. And then based on that new electricity load, you wanna then look at what solar could do to cover the rest of it. So um, it's really important to reduce first and then consider solar. We do have a separate class specifically on efficiency. It's called Energy Upgrade, and you can find it at the same place in Eventbrite where you found this class. Um, and uh, we do give away energy saving kits and have been doing this for several years. So if you wanna go that track and learn that, we would love to have you in that class as well. So I think most of you are aware of the benefits of solar or you wouldn't be in this class, um, but we like to say that um, everyone comes to solar for a different reason and I don't really care why you like it. I love that it is a diverse group of people that all have different reasons that they're attracted to this technology. Um, it's just great that everyone is interested. So some people are interested in solar because of its energy independence benefits. Some are interested because of the environmental benefits that it provides, the reduced emissions. Some are interested from a financial standpoint. Um, and then um, others might be interested in perhaps increasing their property values. So I've got some data at the end that will give you some information on, on whether that's, that's true. Um, and just sort of generally, it's a, it's a low maintenance strategy um, that has long-term benefits. But I have a feeling more of you would have said I already have solar if there weren't also benef uh, barriers. So some of the barriers that um, many are aware of, there's high upfront costs to get to that longer term benefit. Um, so, so some of these systems are, are fairly expensive up front. Um, we also have fairly low costs of electricity here in Florida, which of course is a benefit. We, we enjoy the benefits of those low costs, but when you're doing a return on investment model for solar, that makes that return go out longer. Um, there may be surface area limitations on your roof, which maybe that's why someone is thinking about ground mounted. Um, you may have shading in your area. Um, and in terms of a utility scale um, solution, that intermittent um, production and the storage issues are also something that people often think about. Um, so we will try to address all of these as we go through it. So what does the county do? Why does Sarasota County care about this topic? And, and what have we done to sort of um, lead by example? Um, we have solar hot water on all of these facilities owned by the county or owned in partnership with the county. Um, one of my favorite stories is that um, Ed Smith Stadium's renovation added solar water heating. So when Orioles are, are doing spring training games there, they're um, showering on water heated with sunshine. In terms of photovoltaic systems, we have them at two locations. Our um, County Operations Center out east on Fruitville has a 57 kilowatt system and my office here at Twin Lakes, um, which you can see behind me in my uh, virtual background, has a 22 kilowatt system and they are providing really good savings to us in terms of our energy bills. So just a, a big picture point before I dig into each of the technologies. Um, you can see the solar potential in this map. So the darker areas have the better um, solar radiation of the more solar reaching the ground that could be captured by the solar systems. Um, we, all, we are calling uh, Florida the sunshine state, but we're not the best region of the United States, but we are really good. Um, the best region is the Southwest where there's less cloud cover. Um, but this little pie chart here shows you the percentage of power generated by solar in the United States. And it's still very, it's still fairly small. If you look at Germany, it's on the far end of that solar radiation spectrum. They don't get nearly as much sun as we do, but they have much more solar implemented in their communities than we do. And that gets to the point that we'll talk about at the end about the importance of policy and incentives. 
All right, so let's dig into the first technology, which is solar pool heating. It's the largest market for solar in, in Florida. Um, the, when you see something on someone's roof, it's most likely gonna be a solar pool panel. Um, they are just plastic panels attached to the roof that can be retrofitted to existing technologies, the existing pool pump. Um, there is um, no energy savings, no cost savings, unless you have an existing electric or gas pool uh, heater. So you may, you may still wanna do it, but I just, from a financial standpoint, it's important to remember, you're not gonna save money unless you're replacing a heater you already are paying for, okay? But if you are replacing one, there's very good economics for these solar pool heaters. Um, if you're replacing natural gas or electricity pool heating, um, you, you can have return on investment as little as uh, two or three years. This is what they look like. It's a very simple, uh, very thin mat of dark colored uh, plastic sheeting. There's another picture to give you a sense of what that looks like on top of the roof. And this is it being retrofitted to an existing pool pump and the timing set so that um, you can take advantage of the sun during the right part of the day. Um, so what's important to know about that is um, it takes the pool water and sends it up to the roof and then it uses the sun through those black mats to um, warm up this, the pool water and then sends it right back into the pool. So it's just an, uh, a closed loop system that just warms the pool water with the sun and then sends it back. Um, you're gonna get increased warm swimming time within your Florida pool, maybe adding another couple months depending on your cold tolerance. Um, and um, again, the financial benefit is only if you're gonna uh, decommission an old pool heater and pool heaters can be very expensive to run. All right, the next one is um, solar water heating. So this again uses um, the solar heat to warm water, but instead in this case, it is uh, warming the water you use for your shower, your laundry, your dishes. Okay, this is the internal domestic water. Um, it does use a water heating tank to store that heated water, and then it also provides backup. So there is gonna be electric backup for cloudy days or when you have people visiting and there's a lot of water use. Um, it's not a new technology. This is something that's been around for, for decades. Uh, this is an advertisement from 1892 for a solar water heater. And if you come to our office, you can see a solar water heater on the ground that we use here. And it looks really similar to this one. These tubes and our sort of black colored covered box. It's just fascinating how simple the technology is. Unfortunately, the price is no longer $25. Um, this is what one looked like in the 1930s down near Miami. And um, this little arrow is pointing at what is actually a fake chimney. This is the, um, the water tank. The heated water was sent to this tank um, and then the tank used gravity to send it into the, the home. And then this is what they look like now in modern day here in our community. Um, they are smaller than the pool heaters um, and they provide the, um, the heat to then store it in the tank until you need it. So the cold water goes in, gets warmed by the panel and then it stays in the tank until you're ready for the shower or the laundry. Um, one thing to think about is, is the size of the tank. Sometimes the tanks can be a little bit larger in order to uh, hold the heated water from the day and then use it at night. Um, and there's a sizing table at the Florida Solar Energy Center's website to give you a sense of what you might need in your household. Like I said, they all do have conventional energy backup um, so that you um, aren't gonna be without hot water on, on cloudy days. Um, the questions in the chat box have been about um, sort of tax incentives and other incentives available. Um, there is a federal tax credit that is currently at 26%. It's gonna reduce to 22% in 2021. So this is a, um, it was set up by Congress to be multiple years, but in 2019, it went from 30 to 26 for 2020, and it goes to 22% in 2021. So they're trying to ratchet it down. It is possible that Congress might increase it again, but it's important to think about that when you're doing the math on these products. Um, Energy Star rated solar water heaters um, qualify for that tax incentive. Um, and it, they are also exempt from sales tax in, um, in Florida. And there are no, current, no utility rebates here in Sarasota um, in the FPL territory. So there is a calculator on the Florida Solar Energy Center website 
Um, and it's based on um, your local rate of energy costs, which is about 10 cents per kilowatt hour for us here in FPL territory. Um, and about a $4,000 system cost. Um, you'll certainly wanna get quotes on that, but that's an estimate. Um, and I did it with an estimate of four people in a household, and this is really gonna affect your return on investment because if there's only one or two of you in your house, you use less water and that then decreases the return on investment, right? So this is for a household of four. It found a simple payback of 11 years, but it's important to know that this calculator uses the 30% tax credit, not the 26 that's in place right now. So I, I, um, it overestimated it at, um, so it, the actual payback is more like 12 and a half years. All right, so I'm gonna take a minute to um, look at the chat box and see if there are questions on either pool or water heating. Um, these are some questions for later, good questions, thank you. Uh, does solar heating for a pool make the pool work harder since it has to pump the water up to the roof? That's an interesting question. Um, I haven't heard that from the pool uh, technicians or the solar technicians that I've talked to. Um, I personally have um, solar water heating and have at two homes and have not had any trouble with the pump. Um, I have heard from some people that the, the black mats themselves can, in some cases, um, have not lasted as long as people had hoped they did. Um, so you'll wanna make sure you get a high quality of that, um, of the panel itself, because in Florida, particularly sort of black plastic can have a hard time in the heat, um, but I haven't heard an impact on the pump. So um, that doesn't mean it hasn't happened, but I, that's not something I've heard of and I've been doing these classes for a while. All right, I don't see any other um, pool or water heating classes. So I'm gonna keep the rest of them for the uh, photovoltaic, which I think is why most of you are here. So let's dig into that. All right, photovoltaic is the third um, technology. It is um, where we actually generate electricity from the sun. So the others were just using the heat, but in this case, we're gonna generate electricity for use in our home or in our barn. Um, so the system can be standalone or it can interact with the utility system. Just in terms of terminology, the cell is one of these small squares. It's the basic building block. Um, and then the panel is one of these rectangles. Um, and then the system is multiple panels that get put into one whole system, okay? Um, it can be used on a small scale. So I often ask people, do you have solar in your home? Most people will say no, but in reality, many of us do. We have it in a calculator. We might have it in landscape lights. It's um, pretty prevalent now. Um, and we in the county use them for standalone um, signage on the roads. These are some examples of the off-grid applications at farms, but it, um, and then this one is for lighting but um, you may understand that the lighting would need battery backup because the time when you need the lights, the sun isn't shining. But I think most of you seem to be here for um, questions about residential solar and, and almost all of those are gonna be uh, grid connected. So you're gonna connect it to your FPL service. And this is what those are looking like, okay? So we've got a system with multiple panels. It can also just be really pretty. This is an example here in Sarasota um, where uh, it was designed into the architecture to be part of the shading for this home. Um, and it, it really ended up beautiful. So how does it work? For a utility interactive system, the, the PV array on the roof or on the ground um, collects the, um, the sun's rays and, and turns them into power, but it needs an inverter in order to then turn the power into this, the way the home can use it, okay? Um, and then it immediately goes to the loads, uh, the electricity loads in the home first. And then anything that is uh, left over goes out to the grid through what we call net metering. We'll talk about that. The inverter is something often people don't think about. They see the panels, but they don't see these boxes that do that translation. So it converts the DC power generated by the system into AC power, which is what our homes use. Um, and there are different types of inverters. You can get a string inverter, that's one inverter for the whole system, or you can get micro inverters that provide that translation for each panel or each collection of panels. And that microinverter can be really useful because if it's shady over part of your system, the microinverter will still get the power from the other panels that are in the sun. Um, whereas the string inverters can be limited. And if it's shady in one part, you're not gonna get any power no matter which ones are in the sun or not. Um, 
You also want to think about the warranty. So the inverters tend to come with a 10 to 15 year warranty and the panels themselves are going to come with a 20 to 25 year warranty. And the panels have an interesting system for the warranty. They come with a decreasing percent of production. So the warranty guarantees that say at year 25, the panels will be producing 80% of what they uh, produced in year one. So they're not saying it'll be 100% then, but you'll get most of the production by year 25. So what's net metering? This is that, um, if you remember the advertisements for cell phones, you could, you could get rollover minutes. That's how um, Florida Power and Light handles net metering. So um, the way it works is, uh, you get offsets for your electric bill. So if one month you produce more than you used in your home, that excess will roll over to the next month. And then if at the end of the year, all of your rollovers are more than you um, used in terms of electricity for the whole year, FPL will write you a check. But the, the utility will only pay at their wholesale rate, not at the rate that you pay. So everything else is just an offset, so it's equal. But once you've gone to the point where they have to write you a check, that check is written at the wholesale rate. So that wholesale rate is less than half um, the, of what we pay, often three cents per kilowatt hour compared to 10 cents per kilowatt hour. Um, so you wanna be very careful not to install more capacity than you are actually going to consume on your site. So you wanna really be careful and look at a year, maybe two years worth of data to know what the maximum um, you might use is and then um, size the system less than that. This is a graphic from the FPL website, gives you a, a good sense of how their net metering works. And there's a link there to uh, frequently asked questions, which is really useful. So um, we often get the question about what if the power goes out? Am I gonna have power when my neighbors don't? And the answer is no, unless you have batteries. So when the grid is down, the solar systems are required to shut off. And that's for safety for those utility workers who are hopefully getting everyone else back up. Um, if you want to have power during a storm or during a uh, blackout, you need to have batteries that then allow the, the um, solar system to feed the batteries instead of the grid. Oh, give me just one second. I apologize, it, it ended my um, slideshow. All right, hopefully you can see that now. So the interconnection agreement with FPL um, that you will have to sign if you um, do a grid connected system, that it is going to um, require that you have a shutoff system when the, when the grid goes down. Um, if you're thinking about batteries, you wanna think about how, days of autonomy. How long do you wanna be able to be off the grid? And what systems in your home do you wanna power? Because you're not likely going to power everything unless you have a big investment in batteries. Um, so there's this art of sizing. You want to talk to your contractor about exactly what you want to power and for how long, and that'll help them figure out what batteries you want. Um, there are what we call standalone inverters that um, only, I only found one provider that, that offers this that literally has one plug in the inverter that allows you to, to plug something in even when the grid is shut down. Um, but generally that is not available with most of the inverters. Um, there are also um, solar generators. So if you were thinking about a gas generator, you could consider instead a solar generator. It tends to be about twice as much expensive, but it's quieter. It doesn't have the carbon monoxide health risks. Um, it's, it just tends to be safer. So um, this is some data you might be interested in for those. Um, and then there are also these uh, much smaller systems that can just charge um, laptops and cell phones. Um, and you might have seen uh, like solar powered backpacks that you can use to um, just uh, charge um, small items. So those are some alternatives if you do not go the full direction of um, a solar system with batteries. Another question we get is what about hurricanes? So um, will, the, will the panels uh, endure the winds of a hurricane? All Florida systems have to be designed to withstand the same winds that the roof itself has to withstand. So the wind uplift requirements are set by the Florida Building Code. They vary by region, but it's the same um, sort of fastening as you would have to have for your roof. Um, the engineering designs have to be reviewed um, and approved by the Florida Solar Energy Center. Um, and you may wanna uh, inform your insurance company 
um, that you want to include your solar system in your policy. So um, you will then have an increased value of your home. You want to make sure that that value is covered by your insurance. Um, there's a, a um, National Renewable Energy Lab study that found that um, solar panels had effective or underperforming panels um, less than 0.1% per year. Um, so they are, they are very um, sturdy. This image is from Tyndall Air Force Base after Hurricane Michael a couple of years ago. Um, and it's really interesting because you can see the, the shingles on, on these buildings actually um, were more protected on the sides with the, um, with the solar. Um, so there is some anecdotal um, evidence that the panels may actually protect a roof. Uh, there are no studies that have shown that, but there are lots of pictures and, and stories of people who have gone through hurricanes and their panels did survive well. All right, so let's get into the financial side. The incentives. So the same tax credit applies to photovoltaic as, as hot water. We're at the 26% mark right now, and it goes down to 22%. It's also exempt from sales tax here in Florida, so that gets you another um, 6 or 7%, depending on which county you're in. It's also exempt from residential property assessment. So what that means is if you put a $25,000 system on your home, which used to be valued at $300,000, your home taxable value will stay at $300,000. They're not gonna increase it to 325 with that extra um, solar value on top of it. So that's gonna save you on, um, uh, by not having increased property taxes as a result. There's also a tangible personal property tax exemption that was passed by the voters a couple years ago. That one's mostly relevant for commercial installations, but it, it is also a, um, an incentive in Florida. And again, there are no um, utility rebates at this time. All right, so when you're looking at your particular site, what do you want to be thinking about? You want to be thinking about which way your roof is uh, placing, um, the, which way the roof is facing, the um, you want to be looking at south to southwest are the best in our region. You also want to think about the roof space and the shape. So again, a, a single panel of a roof is easier for it to catch the sun all the time. But if you have a, um, a roof going in different directions, your contractor will be able to work with that. Um, roof age is really important. So um, I have several people who started down the path to get solar and then they realized that they needed a new roof in 10 years, five years, um, and they decided to wait those five years and then do the roof and the solar system at the same time. Because if you already have a solar system and then you need to replace your roof, you have to pay someone to come out, remove the solar system, and then they replace the roof and then they come back out and put the solar system back on. Um, so that's an added cost to that new roof. Um, you may also have shading. Um, if you have a you know, beautiful tree that um, you value in your yard that shades part of your roof, that limits that section of the roof that can be used for solar. Um, you certainly don't want to cut the tree down. Um, there's uh, climate value for trees and all kinds of reasons to keep your trees. So we just want to balance those two priorities. Um, the other thing is the energy needs to be on a single meter. So this is most cases not an issue, but in some cases, particularly the person who mentioned they were interested in their barn, you wanna know what your barn's electric meter usage is, not the home, okay? So we wanna make sure that the meter is tied to the usage. There was a story of someone in Sarasota many years ago who wanted to put solar on their barn, but they did the calculation based on the energy use in their home. And so it was oversized. And so then they, they ended up um, not getting the return on investment that they had hoped for. And then some people um, do hope to stay in their home for um, uh, many years because that way they can actually benefit from those cost savings. All right, so the system size itself, you wanna think about how much you use in electricity, like I've said, um, you don't wanna oversize it. You also wanna think about what you might be planning in terms of efficiency. So if you're planning to get a new air conditioner and new windows, that's gonna decrease the amount of energy you use in those future years. So you don't wanna size your system for what you use now. You wanna size it for what you expect to use once you've completed those efficiency improvements. Um, you also need to think about you know, what your roof size can accommodate. And then this is kind of a, a wonky, wonky detail, but if you're thinking of a larger size system, be aware that the um, FPL interconnection is um, designed in tiers. So if your system is gonna be less than 10 kilowatts, the cost is much less and the, um, the um, 
If you go above 10 kilowatts, it then has an additional $400 fee and you have to provide a million dollar liability insurance to FPL. So um, there is added cost if you're going with that larger system size. So just be aware of those um, additional steps with that interconnection agreement if you're looking at a larger system. Okay, let me take a minute and see if there are any questions on what we've covered so far. Um, okay, so the point about um, ground mounted panels. Um, if your roof doesn't accommodate it well or you have plenty of room on the ground, there are ground mounted systems. In fact, um, Sarasota County has a ground mounted system at our operations center east on Fruitville. If you want to see one, um, you can see the sort of racking system that um, sort of puts it at an angle at a, a triangular. So there, um, there are costs to that racking system, but in general, um, the ground mounted um, can be about the same cost as the roof because there's added costs to having it on the roof. So the racking system on the ground is more, but then there's these added um, costs of the penetrations in the roof. So I've, I've heard that it balances out to do it um, ground mounted. And it also gives you a little more flexibility of um, making sure you get the, the accurate angle. If you want to maximize your solar potential, you can do that more easily on the ground. So ground mounted is definitely a, a good option. Um, let's see. We talked about the um, tax credits in 2020 and 2021. Uh, we've talked about hurricanes. Um, oh, the materials that are best for a roof. So if you are getting a new roof, um, you may wanna think about, and you're committed to solar, you may wanna think about what the best roof type is. Um, what the experts have told me is your best bet is um, a standing seam metal roof, um, which particularly can be designed in a way that is exactly the right width for the solar panels. So they can go between the seams and the metal roof. Um, and they also can be ballasted um, on the roof in a way that, that really handles the hurricanes well. So metal roofs are best for hurricane protection. They can also be best for, uh, for solar installations. Um, the next is probably um, general asphalt shingles. Um, barrel tile roofs are not great for solar, but it can be done. It just can be a little bit more expensive. Let's see. Um, so the question about does it increase your insurance for your home? So good question. I told you to let your insurance know before you buy them, you might actually want to call them and ask them that question. I've heard two stories on that. One was from a couple insurance um, vendors who said, no, it doesn't tend to do so. And then another one told me that, yeah, it can if you're already at like a value threshold. So I think insurers um, de define costs based on the value that they're insuring. So if the solar system bumps you up over those thresholds for them, it can increase your costs. So it would be good to call your insurer to understand that before you get it installed. Um, and then to call them afterward to make sure that it gets added to your policy. Um, question, can you run direct during the day without a battery storage um, option? Essentially the system does that. Um, it, it, it serves your home first and anything that's excess goes to the grid. Um, that the bypassing the grid is, is, um, isn't really necessary because it already does that um, and it, it's only the excess that goes to the grid. So I hope that's answering that question. Um, there's a question about the solar generators I showed. Are there some that are more powerful than 1500 watts? Um, I did see some, I was trying to find some that were a, a decent price. So yes, there were some larger capacity generators um, but not a lot because they try to make them portable. So the bigger they are, the heavier the batteries and the systems are, um, and they need to sort of unfold to capture the sun too. So um, the ones that I saw were a little bit more than that, but um, the sort of general market availability were around that range to up to like 2000. Um, are condo owners eligible for tax credits? So it depends, well, in theory, yes, but you'll want to talk to your condo association because in most cases it's the association that owns the roof. Um, and so it may be the association that has to put the panels on. And um, the tax credits are available for residential and commercial, so they should be able to take advantage of it. But if they're a nonprofit association, there may be difficulties with that. Um, so there, it just gets a little more complicated when the association is the one that's actually installing it. Um, if you own your roof, um, then it is essentially the same uh, process as a residential. 
Uh, there's a question about the Tesla roof, which I'll talk about um, toward the end and that sort of future of solar section um, and more tools to calculate the savings, which is a perfect segue. So let's jump into that. Um, I've got a couple tools here. One is the simplest and it's called Project Sunroof. It's a, it's a Google tool. Um, you literally just search for Project Sunroof and it comes up or you can go to this link here. Um, and this is an example of a home um, that actually has a lot of oak trees around it. So you can see the shading is really an impact here compared to this home that is fully sun um, accessible. So when this home is looked at, it tells you the square foot available for the panels, um, the hours of usable sunlight per year, the estimated savings, and it allows you to change your utility bill down here, and it gives you a recommended solar installation size. But you'll notice that that does it at 99% of your usage, and it doesn't know your usage, right? I haven't put anything in here, so you want to be really careful with these estimates, but it's a good starting point just to give you a sense of what your roof looks like and what the solar potential is. If you are techie and like to play around with numbers, a better tool is called PV Watts. And that link is down here. This is actually the tool that many contractors use. Um, you can put in your specific address and um, then you can play with the system information as well as the month by month expected um, uh, radiation potential and energy value. So this one is, is for more of the sort of engineering minded folks that want to play with the details. Um, so I, I would encourage you to, to look at these sites before you call contractors so you feel a little bit more comfortable with the scale of what you could do and then ask them for more detailed estimates. All right, so I keep mentioning contractors. This is really important. When looking at contractors, just like you would for any home improvement, or you would want to look at several things. You want to look at their years of experience, but you want to look at their experience doing this type of installation. So if you're choosing to go with solar pool heating, you want people who've done a lot of solar pool heating. If you're looking to go with photovoltaic, you don't want the pool heating guys you want, uh, or gals. You want the uh, people with experience with photovoltaic, okay? You wanna ask them how many installations they've done locally of that type of solar. You wanna ask for their solar contractor's license. They don't technically have to have one. They can have an electrical license, but um, the solar contractor license proves that they've gone through additional training um, and um, is certainly recommended to ask if they have one. NABCEP is an organization that provides additional training to solar installers, um, as well as solar water heating contractors. Again, you don't have to have that, but it might be a sign that they've gone through additional training. Um, there are some contractors locally that have not gotten that designation and are, are fairly well regarded, um, but it's just another thing to look into. Just like anything, you wanna look at their reputation and reviews and, and there, there's a lot of those out there through um, all these different search engines and um, company profile companies. And um, there's, there's a lot of opportunities for that. So do your homework and make sure you look at reviews, ask them for um, recommendations from others that have uh, done these types of products. Always wanna make sure that they have workers compensation and liability insurance and that they're covered for anything that, they might, that might happen on your property. Um, and lastly, you want to look at the equipment that they're suggesting to you. So um, there are different types of equipment with different levels. So you, um, you might get sort of the lower level quote from someone and then the higher level quotes from someone else, and that's hard to compare. So make sure that you're getting the same type of production, um, the same quality panels from each one, um, and compare apples to apples. And you want to ask questions about what assumptions they're making in their calculations of return on investment because everyone's going to tell you oh this will pay back in x number of years but but what went into that math in particular we want to ask if they have an inflation on utility rates many of them are going to put in a calculator for three to four percent of increase in utility rates per year but here in sarasota fpl utility rates have been fairly stable for the last 10 years so that assumption um, is, has not been true in the last decade. And so you wanna be careful with those big inflations that might make the system look like a better deal than it is, okay? Um, so that is some thoughts for selecting contractors. Let's see. There's a question about the advantage of paying cash versus financing a system. I do have more information on financing as we go through. Um, so let's come back to that after we've gone through some of these case studies. So this case study is someone who has shared their details with me. Um, it's here in Sarasota um, and a, a fun story, but it's been installed a while ago 
So there's parts of it that are no longer relevant. So we'll go through it. Um, they got this installed in 2014 and 2015. It's a 10 kilowatt system um, that cost at the time $37,000. Costs have gone down since then, it's good to know. Um, at the time there was an FPL rebate, so ignore that, that is no longer true. Um, but they did get the tax credit and their, um, their savings per year is about $1,800. Their payback was 3.8 because of that big FPL rebate. But without it, you still have a $17,000 savings without that rebate if they hadn't gotten that. So it's still um, absolutely beneficial. So what, what's been the impact of the system? This person shared that in the six years they've had it, it's generated 100 megawatt hours of electricity. That's the CO2 savings, the carbon dioxide savings of planting 1,800 trees. He didn't have room to plant 1,800 trees on that site. Um, so I think it's a pretty good uh, deal. Um, he also uh, found some equivalencies of 9 million smartphone chargers and that kind of thing. So just some fun calculations. Um, on the months that they consumed less than they produced, their FPL bills were still $9.80. So some people think that on um, the months they overproduce, they're not going to get any bill. It's important to know you still have sort of a baseline cost that is their fees, taxes, those kinds of things. But $10 is still pretty good. This is what their usage looked like. Um, with the year they did not have solar in blue, and then the first year of solar in green. And you can see the months of November, March, and April where they overproduced. And then that rolled over to the months where they underproduced. And in general, they, they did not get a check from FPL. So they, they have the right size system. In the first year, they had that $1,800. They then reinvested that by buying insulation for their home at $1,900. So they're then getting additional savings of $350 a year on top of solar, which they then invested the second year in a new energy efficient washer dryer. So this is sort of my ideal uh, solar customer who is really dedicated to those efficiency improvements. Um, and they expect to keep doing that throughout the years in the system. So here are some other examples, more recent. These are from 2019 that our region solar provided us. A 10 kilowatt system here was only $27,000. So like I said, the price went down. They got the tax credit and their net actual cost was $18,900. Um, their savings per year is about $2,000. So their payback period um, is nine years. So the payback has really gotten better in the last uh, several years. This system is again a 10 kilowatt system um, and they got the tax credit. They had a payback of about 7.9 years. Um, and what we, we like to calculate the number of free electricity years. So this one has about 17 years of free electricity. Um, this one, so this again was a shingle roof, single story. This again was shingle roof from a different contractor. Um, and what's different about this one is that they have financing. So someone asked about the cost of financing. So they have a 7.5% interest rate at a 25 year term with $1,000 in closing costs. Um, so what happens is they pay down the loan um, when they receive their tax credit. So the payments might be higher in the first year, but then they get their tax credit and they pay down the loan sum, and then their payments are gonna be lower. Um, so that's why it shows different loan payments based on those different um, loan amounts. The net savings after 10 years is $3,600. So you can see that net savings really changes based on that interest rate of 7.5% and those closing costs. So the, the difference between paying cash and, and financing it is gonna be that cost of capital, the interest and the closing costs that you don't pay when you pay cash. But for those that, um, that um, don't have the cash in the bank or wanna use that cash for something else, uh, financing is certainly something to think about. Um, this is a tile roof. I told you that's a little bit more expensive to install and it's a larger, um, uh, system, a 14 kilowatt system, um, but they still had a payback of about nine years. It's just a, a higher total amount. Um, this one mentioned that FPL increase, but in reality that hasn't happened. They've found other ways to decrease the costs. So you want to be careful about those escalation rates that might be in the assumptions. These are older quotes, so I'm not going to go through each of them, but you will have them um, when I send out the PowerPoint. So you can let me know if you have questions. It gives you some other examples of financing. Um, this one has a lower interest rate, um, but it's based on equity. So you would need to have equity in your home uh, to get that lower interest rate. 
And this one has a battery, in this case, a Tesla Powerwall. So it increases the cost of the system um, and then um, does not affect the savings because the battery doesn't increase the amount you save. It just provides you that resiliency in times of a storm, right? Um, so this gives you details on that battery backup. All right. Um, so the incentives, right, like I said, most, the only incentives that really are in place right now are that tax credit, which is decreasing over the years. But you can look at this website, which is the database of state incentives for renewable energy, desireusa.org. Um, and you can look in our region specifically and see if there's anything else that, that gets added over time, depending on when you do this. So here's a little bit more on the, the financing options. So cash, like we talked about, is gonna be your cheapest option. Um, there is a solar co-op that I'll tell you more about in a minute. Um, there are also some other options uh, for financing that are listed here, and their interest rates are going to vary, and the requirements for equity and other things are, and credit checks are going to vary, um, but these are all listed to give you a sense of the type of interest that you might have um, if you were to finance. Um, there's a uh, property assessed clean energy program that's offered here in Sarasota County where you pay it back on your property taxes. Um, with about a six to nine percent. Um, there are some private unsecured loans um, that are sort of seven to ten percent but with shorter terms um, and they are they don't need equity and they're unsecured but they're shorter terms. So you need to think about all of these different pieces of financing to understand what might be your best option. So the co-op. This is basically a bulk buy program that is open now here in Sarasota County. They only do maybe one of these co-ops a year. Um, and so the deadline to sign up is December 4th. If you sign up, you're not committed to buy it through, buy a solar system through them. You're just committed to, to talk to the contractor that they select and get a quote. Um, and the quote is part of a, um, a bulk buy that they do through this group um, solicitation. So everyone who signs up for the co-op then is part of this one contractor um, that gets selected by the group um, and hopefully provides a better rate because it's for multiple customers. Um, you then have the option to purchase if your quote ends up being something that you, you want to move forward with. Um, so if you're interested, the website is here. Um, you would need to sign up before December 4th in order to be a part of that. They are thinking about doing one again in 2021. So there's also a program called Solar Together that is now offered through Florida Power and Light. And it is their version of what's called community solar. It's where they install big uh, utility scale solar systems, and then they sell back portions of those systems to their customers. Um, and so it was approved by the Public Service Commission in March, um, and they have set aside 25% for residential. Um, and so what happens is that you buy into this, and for the first few years, your bills are actually going to go up. But then after they calculate in maybe year three or four, you'll start to see savings. And the longer you stay in, the more savings you're gonna see. And so you don't actually install it on your property. They install it, but you subscribe to the system um, and you um, get the bill credits for your share of the production that you purchase. So um, this could work for those of you who might be in condominium associations um, who, or who have very shady roofs. Um, but if you're committed to having it on your own property, um, that this is not, that is not your option. Um, this is for those that, that don't end up doing it on their property, but would still like to support solar. So I mentioned the increase in property values. So there was a 2016 study nationwide, and we were fortunate actually to have four of the examples here in, in Sarasota County. Um, and they compared appraisals of um, pairs of homes, both with and without solar in four states. And they found that um, the solar systems did increase the value, the sale value of the home um, between three and 6%. So it boosted the price between 10 and $22,000. So if you had just purchased the, the system, maybe that's not a great deal, but if you've had it for a while, that's a pretty good uh, return on investment. So they did find that there is an increase in property value, but you wanna be careful because if we end up in say a market downturn, that's not going to convey, right? If the whole market goes down, then you might lose some of those. So much of it is timing, but generally in this study, they did find that there were property value increases. Okay, so let me, because we're getting close to time, I do have more on policy and um, trends, but let me take a second for the questions. 
Um, what happens to the old panels when they need to be replaced and how does that affect the ecosystem? Are there hazardous materials in the panels? That's a really good question. Um, there are um, what we call rare earth materials in the panels and um, there are efforts to um, recycle and reuse the panels, um, but that you have to have a, a manufacturer that's willing to take it back. So um, some of them do do that and others say, no, just, just put it in the landfill. So we, we would encourage you to try to find manufacturers that have take back policies that would then recycle, particularly those rare earth metals that, that can be um, in limited supply. Um, and there are industry efforts right now to increase that um, sort of circular economy of the panels and find a recycling system that will, will capture them. Um, but we're talking, you know, 20, 25 years out from now. So hopefully those systems will be much better in place by then. Um, so yes, I, I did say that they are expected to produce for 20, they're guaranteed, they're warranted for 20 to 25 years. Um, and then there are many panels that are still on roofs from 30, 35 years um, ago. It really just sort of depends um, for the system, but the warranty itself is often for 20 or 25 years. Uh, there was a question about prices, including batteries. Only one of the examples I gave you included batteries. So you want to be, um, make sure you are aware that that is definitely an added cost on top of the system itself. Um, for those of you that are not in Florida Power and Light territory, there are different incentives and different programs available to you. So someone's in Duke Energy, they have different community solar programs, they may have different incentives available. So you will want to go to that DSIREUSA.org site and specifically put in your address and your utility, and you may have better deals than we have here in Sarasota County. So um, definitely look at your local context and contact your utility specifically. All right, so those are the questions I see for now. Um, there's the Tesla one, which I will get to in just a minute. Um, keep putting those questions in and I'm gonna keep going until we're at the one o'clock mark. Um, all right, so what about policy? I mentioned at the beginning that a lot of what drives who puts solar on where is the local policy. So here in Florida, we have the residential sales tax exemption that I mentioned. We also have ingrained solar rights. So these are, um, the right for you in a homeowners association um, for them not to limit your right to have solar. So this is important. Some people have come to me and said, oh, my, my HOA doesn't want me to have solar. They won't let me do it. And I say, ah, Florida statutes 163.04. Show them that part of the statute and they need to let you put solar on your roof. They might have a say in sort of what, what it looks like. You can, they might still try to negotiate a little bit, but you have the right to do solar on your property. That's really important. Um, and they, the state has also enabled that property assessed clean energy financing that I mentioned. What we don't have in Florida is a renewable portfolio standard, which requires utilities to um, provide a certain percentage of their power through, um, through renewables. Um, we also don't have power purchase agreements, which would let a third party company come in and put the, um, the panels on your roof and then charge you for the electricity. In our state, the only company that can charge you for the electricity is your um, monopoly utility. Um, there are leases that are beginning to be implemented and that's close to a power purchase agreement, but it doesn't have all the benefits. So you'll wanna be careful about that. Um, and then the utilities are not required to sort of incentivize or provide these rebates that they used to have um, by our state regulating agency. So, all right, so the future is pretty exciting for solar. Um, I'm sure many of you have heard about um, the solar roofs that are being talked about by Tesla and other companies. Um, these are tiles that actually um, produce the solar themselves without additional panels. Um, what I have heard is that we are at least three years away from having them um, in the market here in Florida. Um, they are starting in the states that have more incentives, okay? So they're starting in the Californias and the New Jerseys and they're bringing them to states like Florida that don't have those incentives later. They also have to do a lot of groundwork to, to make partnerships with the roofers because they're not used to putting solar on. It's solar contractors that have done that. So um, there, are, there are some that are already affiliated with Tesla. So you may wanna ask your solar contractor if they have that relationship and if it is available. Um, but what I've heard is that it's still a couple years out here in Florida. Um, so, um, and then the other part of that is you may have heard that the, the solar roof would be the same cost as a roof being installed. 
The thing is that that was calculated for those states with lots of incentives. Consumer Reports did a study of comparing a Tesla roof in Texas to a Tesla roof in California. The one in California actually was about the same as the cost of the roof. The one in Texas was not because they didn't have those incentives that might bring down that cost of solar. Another one that I'm pretty excited about is floating solar, and they are putting these on um, reservoirs and stormwater ponds um, to produce large amounts of solar. And that works really well here in Florida where we have these, these big bodies of water for stormwater management and other things. Um, and then let's see, the rest of this is, is sort of fun data heavy stuff, but it's not as relevant for those of you that are thinking about solar on your property. So let me take a minute and just see if I've missed any other questions. Um, so that there's someone that said companies will put solar on your property for no cost except the monthly rent payment. So um, there are companies that um, in other states that would be what's called a power purchase agreement. Here in Florida, they're trying to do it with a lease model. Um, so it's not, you know, paying for the utility cost. It's more leasing the solar panels. Um, and there are, there are companies that are starting to do that. Um, it's just not very uh, popular yet because there's different red tape than, than they're used to in other states. So um, you certainly can ask about those lease, solar lease models that are being used. But again, that's a finance model. So you wanna think about that cost of capital. So the cost of the lease is gonna increase that, um, that total cost of ownership for the solar system. All right. I don't see any more logistics questions, so I'll just dig into the solar trends. Um, again, it's, it's more for the, the policy wonks and the um, data wonks that are interested in this. So um, I've mentioned a lot of the trends in solar. So nationally, solar has just grown tremendously since 2013, um, it, but it is still a very small percentage of the nation's power. Um, the nation is really only getting 2.1% um, of our electricity from solar. Um, states like California, California is the most at 17%, but even the top 10 are only at 4% of their power. It is the fastest growing job in the United States in many states, including Florida and North Carolina, or I guess that's South Carolina, uh, as well as California. So all these um, orange ones are solar being this really fast growing job. And there's a job census report for solar um, that 2019 found that uh, there were 12,000 solar jobs in Florida, um, 9,000 of which were installers. And you can't, you can't outsource that, right? You really need a local person to install it on your roof. So these are our local community members who are doing this. Um, and there were 1,800 new, Florida, new jobs, solar jobs in Florida in 2019. All right, so there's another question about, I think that's again, condo association restrictions. Um, so most of that's gonna be about the ownership of the roof and any of the rules that the condo association might have on its own members within its covenants. So it may have limitations on um, what is allowed in its, its own condo association covenants. Um, and those solar rights um, I am not sure if it conveys to condos. I have heard that there are many more barriers for condos than there are for single family homes in homeowners associations. So it is the solar rights for homeowners, single family homeowners are easier to um, take advantage of than those in condos associations. So you need to understand the ownership of the roof, convince the uh, condo association that it's something you all wanna do. Um, I worked with a condo association down in Venice and we, we uh, got quotes and talked about what that long-term investment might look like for them, as well as the savings for them as a whole, really made the case, had some champions within their community who really wanted to do it. They ended up deciding not to, they voted against it, even though a good portion of their um, residents wanted to, they didn't end up with the majority. So I'm not saying that's um, going to always happen, but it's just, there are these extra steps depending on the ownership relationships within that condo association. I'm happy to talk with you further offline about that if you wanna um, explore it further. Um, we've got one more minute. Um, so I'm just gonna quickly go through these slides so you know what they are when you get them and then you can ask me if you have questions. So this gives you data on what's happening for trends within the Southeast. This is what's happening for solar within the Florida Power and Light uh, utility region. 
Um, they really have made commitments in, starting in 2019 to increase, but for now, they only have 1.5% of their power from solar, but they expect that to increase um, over the next uh, 20 years. Um, and they also started that Solar Together program we talked about. These are data from here in Sarasota County. Um, we have 1,500 solar installations across Sarasota County. Those are the interconnections with FPL. Um, and we've already had three co-ops, the one that's happening now and one more planned. Um, and the city itself, uh, city of Sarasota has committed to 100% um, renewable energy by 2045. So there is a lot of momentum happening locally. And so these increases in solar, I'm, I just sort of outline why. We've talked about the importance of policy in driving those numbers. There's also the importance of price. This shows you the tremendous decrease in the last uh, 20 years or so in price per kilowatt installed. The red is commercial, the blue is residential, but they both just come down tremendously. And the last one is demand. People like you who are, are really making this something that's important in their community. Um, the Solar United Neighbors and the co-op um, Ready for 100 people here in Sarasota um, really made a difference as, um, and we in the county have been designated Soul Smart Silver um, for our efforts to try to encourage it in the community. Um, so that is the full presentation. I got you in exactly an hour. I hope that I also answered your questions throughout. Um, I'm happy to stay on um, and answer any further questions, but I wanna thank everyone who joined and the official presentation is over. Um, I will send out the slides as soon as I can and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you everyone for joining.